There are, in fact, four major species around the world. And the European eel, the American eel, the Japanese eel, and then an the eel that goes into uh, Australia and New Zealand. They have the same life cycle. They spawn in the ocean and come in, most of them come into fresh water, mature, and then go back. In, in the St. Lawrence River system, those eels are up to 20 years of age. So it takes a, it's a 20 year generation time. They're spent, they come in at about six to eight years of age, and they spend about 12 to 14 years in, in, in the upper St. Lawrence River and they can do it. We know from historic information that at one time they were probably half the inshore weight of fish in the upper St. Lawrence River and Lake Ontario. In fact, the interesting thing is that all these eels that are in fresh water in the upper St. Lawrence River and Lake Ontario are almost exclusively female. So they're really important because they're the egg producers. We know now from some, some scientific studies that if the density of the number of eels is more than about uh, 50 per acre. They're actually males. If they're lower than 50 per acre, they're females. The males appear to be in the Gulf area, in the brackish water, in large densities, and they're much smaller and they mature younger. The interesting thing is that that particular species has been around for 125 million years, unchanged. And we have never seen a spawning eel. All we've seen is that eels go towards the Sargasso Sea, which is the Bermuda Triangle in the ocean, and, and then about six to eight months later, these leptocephali, these little clear willow leaves, drift in the Gulf Stream from the Sargasso, but we have never seen a spawning eel. And I think that's really strange. I think it's disappointing that we haven't been able to fully understand that animal, especially given the dramatic decline that we're now seeing in the species. Moser Saunders Dam was a big dam that was put in at Cornwall in 1958, uh, and it actually blocked passage of eels coming up the river from 58, 59 to 1974. In 1974, and up to the, in the early 70s, there were so many eels below the dam that they decided to let them come up the river. And in fact, they put a ladder in, and that ladder collected information on passage. So in the 90s, when I was a scientist on Lake Ontario, I started looking at those eel numbers and I saw the passage was about a million eels a year through the uh, late 70s and early 80s and then it started to climb dramatically to the point where in the 90s it was as few as a thousand coming up and the de decline in numbers was just dramatic. So that, then I decided that we needed to start to study this problem in some detail. And other scientists, in fact, around the world were starting to talk about the decline of these freshwater reels. I analyzed a, a lot of data, a lot of information from the U.S. commercial catch data, for example, and, and we realized that this decline was universal. We published a number of scientific papers indicating that. And, and first of all, we had to convince the scientific community that this was real. Um, that took quite a while, actually. That took about 10 years. Uh, so after about 10 years, about the early 2000s, uh, mid-2000s, people started to realize across the range that the decline was dramatic. And then they started to do something about it. Yeah, well, I asked this guy, this old uh, fellow, Tommy Taylor was his name, and he... Uh, he was a, quite a carver. He made the, lots of little carvings and stuff. That, and I asked him if he would make me a bow and arrow. And he said, yeah. And I waited and waited and waited and waited. And he never come up with a bow and arrow. And I went to talk to him one day. And uh, <coughs> asked him why. I was only about six years old, I guess. <laughs> Maybe at the time. I wasn't going to school yet anyway. And uh, I went to talk to him and asked him wh what was the hold up on the bow and arrow. And he says, I've got the bare arrows all made and the bow is pretty near finished, but I am waiting to catch an eel, he said. And I'm going to put an eel skin on the bow for your, for your handle on it. 
They used to use a night line, set night lines out with bait on them, and, and then they'd go around in the morning and check them out, see what they'd caught overnight. <laughs> but after a while, he caught the eight, and he just took a, about a, six inches of the skin and pulled it up onto this part of the bowl where he had made a handle lick and uh, let it dry on there. He had it soaking wet, and I guess when, the, when he pulled it up there and stretched it on, and they wanted to dry it, that hardened and fastened right onto the bow. <laughs> it felt good. It just felt like a good leather handle, like <laughs> like it was uh, almost soft, like a like a leather feeling. In the early '80s. I and some friends did a lot of scuba diving. And once we were scuba diving inside an abandoned power plant at Young's Point, the dam was still there and sort of the structure, but the generators and everything were gone. Just the, and it was like concrete tunnels and concrete rooms. And there were eels in there and different, we were diving at night and they'd be stacked up like firewood sticks, just like on top of each other, stacked up like, like you'd stack firewood. Very skittish and uh, never really got close to them. They were, they were gone. Languages was given to us by the Creator, so therefore, that's that, that's your very own, that's your your own identity. That's how we understand the world worldview and um, describing things because our language is so descriptive. That's um, it's kind of a, a spiritual journey because um, um, because we believe that the Creator gave us uh, our own song. Um, even when you pray, it is said uh, for thousands of years that uh, um, everybody, every nation was to be to use. So therefore, ours is the nation of Imun. So therefore, when we speak to the Creator, we will pray, use our language. And um, because of that, uh, we believe that uh, the language was given to us and um, by the Creator, and therefore we shouldn't, we shouldn't lose it. Uh, there are reasons um, we believe that if uh, when we leave this world, the Creator is going to speak to you in your own language, in your own tongue, and He's going to ask you, you know, what is your name, um, what clan are you, um, do you know your song, do you know your dance, uh, do you know your customs, uh, do you know your language and your spirituality. Those are the very reasons why we uh, keep the language. This is part of your identity. That's who you are. You would be taught um, um, you don't waste. Every part of the fish is, um, is eaten and used in many different parts. The meat, the bones, and how you sacrifice um, to the spirits. And uh, when you do um, have a feast, uh, it is said that there are four sacred words that you need to have um, in order to have a feast. If you're um, having a feast, and that's including the spirit that you're going to feed. Um, because you're blessing that, you're, you're grateful for the food that's been given and provided for you by the, you know, the earth. It's a, it's a traditional thing, a cultural thing, but yeah, a lot of people, and they like fish, and they like fishing. And it, it's a, a connection, I guess, to our ancestors and, and to our past. Uh, people fish because they, they've always fished. They, this, is, this is what we do at this time of year, we fish, sort of. So, the, the, yeah, it's a cultural, social activity.
I, I would say that uh, people acquire a lot from associating with the natural environment, and I think we're losing contact with the natural environment. I think it's really important to uh, understand the natural environment and to use fish and use fish respectfully. And if you use them respectfully, then you're not going to overexploit them. You're going to harvest them. You're going to consume them. You're going to recreationally fish around them. And, and, and recreational fishing is really important because it helps people associate and, and to respect the natural environment. It's a bellwether species. It's a bellwether species of the aquatic environment. The aquatic environment is in fact an accumulation of everything on the land. So the point is that if we affect things on the land, we're affecting the aquatic environment. If we affect the aquatic environment, we just can't stand on the shores and look at it and, and go like, well, there's water there, everything is fine. We need to look at the creatures in the water. There are functional organisms. And this species could, there's no better fish, fish species to describe a, as a functional organism what we're doing to the aquatic environment. Like told you initially, strongly migratory, it integrates the fresh water with the marine environment. So this is, this is a bellwether species that integrates all of the factors in the aquatic environment. Use the eel as an indicator species. And let's it rekindle our association with this ancient animal. The Aboriginals, the Jesuit relations record a lot about eels. And they record, record a lot about what Aboriginals said about eels. And they have a beautiful statement. And that statement in the uh, Jesuit relations is, and this is the St. Lawrence Iroquois said this. They said, eels allow people to live when all else fails. And I would suggest to you that if we look at this carefully and respectfully, the eel is failing. So if the eel is failing, where does that leave us with our options? <laughs>